Um, we have the illustrious Kieran Ackle giving his session on US internal politics. Give him a hand. Okay, um, so I guess my aim is to keep this for about what, 45 minutes per hour? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll try and get through this reasonably quickly. Um, basically, US internal politics is something that I think is super, super interesting, which is why I'm really happy to be giving this presentation. Um, I certainly wouldn't claim to be an expert on this topic because there's just so much stuff involved in US politics. Um, I did um, do an internship for a couple of months uh, in the US Senate recently, so I can pass on some of my experiences from there, but this is not meant to be any definitive overview, just um, an outline of some interesting things about US politics, which hopefully will be helpful to today. So, the way I'm going to structure this, um, firstly, just go through the structure of uh, the United States government, the structure of the key institutions uh, which are at play in debates involving uh, the United States government. Uh, then I'm going to look through the election process, uh, distinguish it from the Australian system in a number of ways, look at things like campaign financing and primaries. And finally, I'm just going to look at cool things in the upcoming presidential election, the things I find interesting to talk about that you're going to have to listen to. But more than anything, I want this to be a really interactive session because I think US politics, more than possibly any other country, is something where lots of people know lots of stuff about the issues and find it interesting. So, to get into it, political structure. Okay, the first thing I'm going to look at is the way that the state and federal system is structured in the United States. So who can tell me how state governments work in the United States? How are they organised? Do you have any idea? A rough guess. Yeah. Sort of meant to organize themselves originally, you know, Declaration of Independence, whatever. They were meant to organize themselves as basically their own little countries responsible for everything within them, and the federal government was only there really for foreign policy stuff. Um, I don't think that's quite how it happens anymore, though. Well, I, I think that's quite right, Andrew. To, I mean, to an extent, the US is different from a lot of countries in that they have what's known as a federalist system. But there's a really, really strong emphasis on states' rights. So Australia also has, as you'll know, a federalist system. So there's obviously a Victorian government uh, with a premier, with its own parliament, with its own institutions, which are responsible for a range of things. Um, the United States is quite similar, but I think there's more of an emphasis on restricting the role of the federal government in making a range of decisions that are effective at state level. So what powers does the federal government in the US have? And where do they come from? Does anyone know? I think constitutionally they only have the power to put trade tariffs down and to um, uh, manage foreign policy and declare war. That's about it. Okay. Yeah, that's Okay, so I mean, war is definitely one area. So the idea behind that is that uh, defense is best served as a collective endeavor rather than restricting that to, say, uh, Ohio developing its own defense policy, right? But there's a broader list of things. So basically, the way the American Constitution is structured is that there's a particular set of powers which are given to the federal government. So they're known as the enumerated powers, right? So in the Constitution itself, there's a list of powers to do with things such as trade and commerce, uh, defense, uh, you know, a, a, a fairly limited list of specific powers that is granted to the federal government. And the key thing to note about that system is that in the Constitution, in the Tenth Amendment, it says that any power which is not listed in the Constitution is reserved to the states. Okay? So anything that goes outside the scope of what is explicitly listed in the Constitution is reserved to the state. So what do we think the principal justification is behind this? Why is it that the powers of states are emphasized so strongly? Decentralizing power. Okay, why is that important? Why do we care about decentralizing power? Because, um, well, the states are just so different. I mean, they were at war with each other for a while. Um, California is so completely different from Wyoming that it's impossible to organize a single unified policy that applies to them both equally is the theory. Okay. Yeah. Wasn't it almost all, the only way to get the states to come together was mm. to be so different was to ensure that they kept so much of their own power and that was only just like 
like kept the differences more because they're able to have their own laws and stuff like that. And so now they yep. won't ever be able to fit into the same sort and of mold. When when the Constitution was being written, <laughs> there was still the issue of slavery in some slave states and others not, and the slave states were would only enter into the Union if they were sort of guaranteed under the original Constitution that their right to keep slaves weren't, wasn't threatened. Okay. I think that's all a really excellent background analysis for why a, a Constitution like you see in the United States is at its heart a compromise, right? But what I want to flesh out a little bit more is what is the principal justification behind giving states such significant power. So Finn touched on it when he talked about decentralization, and we've touched on it when we've talked about the differences between states. But why is that actually relevant? Like, why do we care about that in structuring a political system? People in different states want different things. So presumably the logic is that state governments can have more targeted policies and have a better understanding of those constituents that a federal government can ever have of people within states. So states are more likely to be able to have a targeted policy. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the kind of thing which is, I guess, a democratic justification for decentralizing power, right? Real democracy comes when you have localized structures, which reflect the specific differences of the people within those states, right? And that's what one of the primary concerns of the Tea Party movement is, right? So it's easy to, of course, label the Tea Party as a bunch of extremist crazies. Uh, and having been to a Tea Party uh, uh, express <coughs> meeting in the US, I can definitely testify to that being the case often. But one of their realistic and I think quite interesting arguments, right, is that the Constitution is built around <coughs> this idea of decentralizing and localizing power, which is why a system like universal health care, which was introduced by President Obama, is possibly open to criticism, right, for potentially not reflecting the differences and the different views of the people within the 50 states. Okay? So these are groups of people who are often called tenthers in that they defend the Tenth Amendment as the fundamental constitutional principle that power should be devolved to states. Okay? So, so this system is similar to Australia, but like I mentioned, I think in the US this is seen as a much more politically significant issue, this issue of states' rights. But it obviously does still pop, uh, pop up in Australia as we're seeing, seeing even right now with this issue of the mining tax and Western Australia's attempts to collect its revenues in a particular way and assert its rights. Okay, so that's the first thing to know about the state and federal government structure. Then we have this issue of the separation of powers, which is a really crucial constitutional law concept in the US. So can tell, someone tell me what I refer to when I mean separation of powers? Possibly on the slide. <laughs> it means... Three. Three. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, like the power, power that people, power that a legal being deals with, things that people don't really want to have to deal with, and then the executive to manage and make sure that everything actually works. Okay. Is, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so let's try and really define clearly these three separate branches, right? So basically, the US Constitution, quite similarly to the Australian Constitution, recognises a division between the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. Okay. So what is the legislature? Congress and the Senate. Okay, and what is the role of the of legislature? Write laws. Right, okay, so the legislature is meant to make laws. Okay, what does the executive do? And who are we talking about when we're referring to the executive? The White House. The president. The president. The president advises. Okay, who else? Well, in Australia, it would be the cabinet equivalent kind of thing, or it could also be government in general, um, depending on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you have the people at the absolute top of the executive. But the executive also includes government departments, yeah. right? So, for example, they might have the Secretary for Homeland Security who manages the Homeland Security Department, right? And who focuses on pr pr protecting American security, okay? So the executive's role is to administer and enforce the laws that get developed, okay? What about the judiciary? What's their function? Protect the Constitution. Protect the Constitution, right? So ensure that the government doesn't overreach beyond its constitutional powers. Right? But also ensure that the Bill of Rights is protected. We'll look at the Bill of Rights <coughs> shortly. Okay? So what's the justification between separating these branches of power? Why is there a separation between these groups? Uh, to sort of uh, delineate powers so that separate people have it to stop it pe being abused. Okay. Absolutely, right? It's preventing absolute power in any one institution. So the theory is, if you give the president too much power, that can be a harmful thing, because you don't get adequate checks and balances to stop overreach. 
In the same way, too much judicial power can mean that unelected people get too much of an influence right, over really, really important issues that should be devolved to the legislature. Okay? So I want to go through some examples of how this actually plays out in the American system. So how can the executive, so for example the president, check the power of the <coughs> legislature? Veto. Okay, can you explain how that works? Um, not really, I'm better than that. The, the president's allowed some amount of veto, so I can veto anything. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. basically the way it works in America is a bill that is passed in both houses of the Congress can be vetoed by the president. But Congress has the power to override that veto if it can get a two-third majority in both houses in favour of a particular bill, right? But that still gives the president a heck of a lot of power to constrain the legislature, okay? How can the judiciary check the power of the legislature and the executive? And when we're talking about the judiciary, let's, I guess, primarily focus on the Supreme Court. How well, can they strike down the Right, okay, they can declare particular laws as unconstitutional, right? That's a check on the capacity of the elected people to do whatever they want if it's not seen as conforming to correct constitutional principles. How can the legislature check the power of the judiciary? They have to um, check and vote in every new member of the Supreme Court. Right, okay, so they have power over the appointment of the people who make these decisions. That's one important check, okay? What else can they do? They well, can they can pass a bill overriding whatever decision they just made, so long as it's constitutional? Absolutely, right? Or they can try and amend the constitution, right? They can make legislative steps, which actually mean that the prior legal position of the judiciary is no longer tenable, okay? How can the legislature check the power of the executive? How can the legislature check the power of, for example, President Obama? What can they do? They are the ones who control the budget for the executive. Absolutely, so the budget has to be passed and approved through the legislature. What else? What can they do to the president? Impeach. They can impeach the president, right? And it's certainly not a common thing, right? But that is a check on the power of the president, right? If sufficient members of the, of the uh, legislature believe that they should not be in power, okay? So ultimately, the power of every branch in America is constrained by the other branches, which is meant to prevent absolute power. Okay, so does this separation of powers doctrine apply the same in Australia? Is there this clear delineation between legislature, executive, and judiciary? Yeah. No. Oh, do you want to? Oh, sorry. The only um, real difference is the fact that the executive is picked from the legislature. Okay, can you explain how that works? Well, basically, the, the Prime Minister <coughs> um, creates a cabinet out of people that are already Absolutely right, okay? So the members of the, to be Prime Minister, you have to be a member of the House of Representatives, right? The executive is ultimately comprised of the party with the most support in the lower house of parliament, right? So they're actually inextricably linked, right? So that means that in Australia, we don't have as much of a, I guess, a pure separation of powers doctrine that you have in the United States, okay? Which is what distinguishes a parliamentary democracy from a presidential democracy, okay? So now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about all of these institutions and some of the interesting debates that come out of these institutions. So, presidency. Okay, so the first thing I want to really go into, just by way of background, is the process for electing the president. So can someone tell me, how does someone get elected to be president? What are the steps you have to probably go through if you want to be president? Get a nomination from your party. Okay, you have to get a nomination from your party. How does that happen? Well, they have their primaries, so they have their own sort of version of an electoral college and their own sort of election that goes on throughout the entire country. And um, then they vote amongst you know the candidates for the Democratic primary. Although there is a slight difference in that technically the um, representatives from each state or from each district don't actually have to vote with the people of their district in the Democratic Party. So there's a lot of political stuff that goes on for that perhaps even more so than in the elections themselves. Okay. Um, we'll look at primaries in a little bit... the West Wing. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> we'll look at primaries in a little bit more detail in a moment, right? But the essential first step is you have to win the nomination of your party, which is its own mini-election, I suppose, right? And then you need to receive sufficient votes from the people. And that occurs through this kind of, I guess, almost anachronistic mechanism, which is the Electoral College. So can someone explain what the Electoral College process is and how that works? Um, 
each state has a num depending on its number of seats in the whole Congress, has a representation in picking the um, so for instance which is sorry, two senators plus however House of Representatives people they are. And that's the amount of votes that, that state gets and then depending on which candidate wins the votes of that state is the candidate that gets the amount of points to count towards the total. Right, okay, so just a very quick summary of that. It's not hugely important, I don't think, for any real debate, but just so you have an idea of how it works. Okay, so basically every state is allocated a certain number of what are called uh, electoral college delegates, right? Every state has a certain number, okay? Which is, which is largely based on things such as their size, uh, their demographics, that kind of thing, okay? So every state gets these, these votes, right? And then the people in that state vote um, for a particular uh, delegate, right? And ultimately, these delegates are pledged to vote uh, with the person that gets the most number of votes, okay? That probably sounds a little bit confusing. So instead of directly voting for Obama or McCain, you vote for a delegate who eventually votes for Obama or McCain, okay? So it doesn't make that big a difference. I wouldn't stress about that. The key thing is that the distinction in America is you have a much greater capacity to actually control who the individual is who is the president. Right? So how does it work in Australia? The leader of the party is the president. Right, exactly. Right? So, no, so no one got a say when Julia Gillard became Prime Minister, right? Because she won a parliamentary battle between the, with, within the Labour Party, and that meant that she got selected as Prime Minister. Okay? Now, what do you think the strength of the Australian system is? Why could that be a good thing? don't need to call an election to replace the leader, but that's not quite true of America either. Mm -hmm. Why could it be a good thing that the people in the party itself are making that decision rather than Perhaps individual it's votes? because they're making a decision on more on who is more qualified to actually do that job rather than who is more popular. Mm -hmm. Although that's not quite uh, Because they need to have a working relationship, because presumably the, the cabinet needs to be able to work with the leader and the leader needs to be able to work with people who are going to make up that government. So yeah. they should have a, like a strong say than random members of the public. We don't even have to interact with those people. Yeah. yeah. Maybe like they need to actually, they should actually be representative of that party, and they should be who you're voting for when you vote in, in mind all the other people you're voting for, because they're still going towards that leader. Whereas when it's really separate, it's less connected to the people you vote for as the leader. I think that's true. I guess I guess the one thing to keep in mind is that the US system is slightly different in terms of where the leader sits with the party. Mm. So, for example, Obama is not a member of Congress, right? He's a separate player who often has to engage with members of Congress as part of his job of trying to get legislation through, but he doesn't actively need to be part of the Democratic uh, Party through all its meetings and that kind of thing. Matt? The other one you've got to keep in mind is the flexibility that's inherent in it. So, for instance, if we had a Prime Minister who did something appalling, you can get rid of him the very next day. Whereas the US, they'd have to fire him, they'd have to have a full new election, they, or they'd bring up the vice president, they'd then have to replace the vice president. There's a lot more fuss that goes into replacing someone who's done something appallingly wrong. Whereas here, we could just go, what's that Kevin Rudd, you're failing as a leader, we're going to replace you now, and we don't have to go for a month's worth of fighting to do it. Okay, so these are all really good points. What are the strengths of the American system? Why might it be better to have greater capacity to directly elect? Um, not even just about that necessarily, but kind of a side thing is it engages people more directly, um, meaning they care more about politics because they get to see an entire presidential election. They have more of a connection to that person who gets elected and that kind of stuff than potentially in the Australian system where they just vote for a party that's hard to engage people in that. Yeah. So the kind of debate topic you might get around this, which must be very bitter, is something about uh, members of a particular uh, political party uh, being able to vote directly for the leader. Right? as opposed to the Australian system, which is, of course, uh, the internal politicking uh, ultimately makes that decision, rather than, say, a grassroots AOP member voting for who they think should be the leader. Okay? So that's the kind of debate you'll get. So I guess what you're going to weigh up is, arguably, that system is more democratic, right? in that you have a greater direct capacity to actually influence who gets selected, right? but at the potential cost of getting the kind of person who's capable of working with his colleagues and will actually be an effective leader. Okay, so that's a trade-off that you have to make there. Okay. Now let's look at Congress. So I've noted that there's the House and the Senate. What are these two separate institutions? How does it work? Anyone tell me? Yeah. House 
grants, bills, and amends, and all of that blocks. Is that okay? Uh, not quite. <laughs> Good job. <Yeah. laughs> no one's trying not to die. <laughs> I was talking about the Australian system. It could be different. Yeah, it's not entirely different, but let's tease this out. Madeline, would you like to? I don't even have a question in all honesty. Okay, so my question is comparing the House and the Senate for the Right, part of it's who's elected to which. So the House, which is the lower house there, has much smaller electorates um, and there are an awful lot more members. Um, and then the Senate is much, much smaller, so it's about what? It's 100 members. Yeah, 100 so members. Two per state. Yeah, two per state. And they, they elect them in alternate alternating so they're, they're only electing one at any given time it's one per state and to a great extent it's the state's house so it used to be that the state legislatures would elect the senators that's now a direct election but the idea is it's supposed to represent state rights okay right so the the difference here so the house is elected for two-year terms right which i think is really perverse right so basically you get elected almost what six months to a year later you need to start campaigning again to preserve your seat, okay? But that's the way the US system has evolved, right? The senators, by contrast, get six-year terms, right? Which is obviously longer than what an Australian um, parliamentarian would get. Although, actually, no, senators no. get six years, don't they? Yeah. But in the House, you get, what, three years? We get eight in the House. Eight? No, it's six. It's definitely six. I'm pretty sure it's six. six. Good thing we know so much about this country but before moving on federal. to America. Yeah. So there's four-year elections in state. Yeah. Three in federal. Yeah, really so, so basically in the US, both the House and the Senate have the capacity to put forward legislation, have votes on issues, right? But the Senate gets some additional powers. So for example, in terms of approving treaties, right, the Senate is the group that votes on the approval of treaties. In the same way, in terms of approving judicial appointments, right, the Senate makes that particular call, okay? Now, who's currently in control of the House? The Republicans. Okay, and when did that happen, and how did that happen? Midterms. Uh, last year, 2010. Okay. They lost an election. So okay. well, sorry, the Democrats lost, the Republicans won. Yep. That's just an election. Okay, and why do we think that happened? People were... Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> they, well, people were upset <coughs> to find out that Obama wasn't magical. Right. <laughs> That's probably not the way the US <laughs> So what kind of environment does that leave President Obama with? Where he has to fight to get anything done. Right, exactly. So what he has now is he, he's confronted with a legislature where in the House of Representatives, the Republicans have a majority in the House, right? In the Senate, the Democrats still have a majority, but it's not a significant majority, right? And what I mean by that will be explained when we look at filibusters. So what are filibusters? It's brilliant. They basically have <laughs> they have no um, real speaking limit. It's just you're not allowed to sit down or have meals or go to the toilet. If you can link in the works of Charles Dickens into your speech somehow, you can read out the collected works of Charles Dickens and just keep going. And you can be asked questions by members of your own house, and those questions can take quite a long time. And so basically, if you don't want to build a pass, all 50... 48 members, say, of your party can just speak for 12 hours each and have lots of questions asked of them and right. delay so, it for as long as possible. Um, so I have a question. How often do these filibuster things actually happen? Okay, so, so I'll just quickly explain what they are and then we'll go into how often they happen. So the, the key thing to know about filibusters is they're basically a mechanism for the minority party in the Senate to obstruct the passage of particular legislation. Right? In the past, they needed to do this through like standing there on the Senate floor quite dramatically and doing this for like hundreds of hours. Right? But these days, you can often do that just by saying, I filibuster. Right? It's actually become really easy to do. Right? The level of filibusters has increased exponentially in the last few years. Right? During the Obama era, I think it's the highest number of filibusters. Right? And basically, the only way you can get around a filibuster is if you have 60 votes out of 100 in the Senate, which means that you can override a filibuster. Okay, So that's basically saying the majority party can override a filibuster in specific circumstances. Okay, Obviously, it's pretty hard to get 60 Senate votes, right? which is why what happened in the midterm elections where the Democrats lost quite a few votes, 
made this almost impossible. Now, they now only have 53 votes, I believe, in the Senate. Okay? Now, what is the justification for filibusters? Right? Because it seems like a really stupid idea. Why are they meant to exist? <coughs> To protect minority rights. Okay. Like, How's that? Well, like if you're if you don't want to have a tyranny of the majority, of the majority in theory, so you don't want to have just the majority doing whatever it likes. So as well as having the constitution as a constraint, you have this as a constraint. Okay. And what does the existence of filibusters do to the way the minority, uh, the majority party, approaches uh, getting things through the Senate? Well, we have to try and get bipartisan support. Right. So the rationale is it allow, it forces them to push towards bipartisanship, right? Because the only way that they can actually stop this filibuster from having an effect is if they manage to lock down 60 votes, right? So the idea is this is an incentive towards com compromise, which actually leads to better legislation, right? What's the argument against filibusters? Can't get anything done. Right. Obstructionism, right? And I guess. The, the problem with filibusters is it assumes that everyone in politics is kind of well-intentioned, right? Mm. They're voting on the merits of every piece of legislation. If someone convinces them that this particular legislation is a good thing, they'll just vote for it, right? Whereas I think the Republicans have quite a direct strategy over the last couple of years of trying to block just about as many things as they could, right? Because they knew that that would reflect badly on the Obama administration, okay? And you saw that with something like healthcare, arguably. Okay. So that's the classic trade-off that Tim Sonrak's always rattling on about, which is accountability versus efficiency, right? So where do you get maximum accountability, arguably? Filibusters. Filibusters, right? That makes sure that only legislation which commands sufficient support can actually get through. You have enough checks and balances within the Congress to get the right stuff through, right? How do you get efficiency? North Korea. North Korea? <laughs> <laughs> Not having filibusters, and I suppose North Korea probably doesn't. <laughs> um, great, okay. So now let's look at this issue of the judiciary, which I think is one of the most interesting issues um, in American politics. So how do people get nominated to, say, the Supreme Court? I'm going to focus on the Supreme Court, obviously there are other institutions. How do people get there? Lots of connections and buying scotch for people. Okay, I just think <laughs> practically how do they get nominated? Oh, they have to, the president like picks someone, mm -hmm. generally someone that's already a judge somewhere, mm -hmm. yeah. and then they have to get, well you said they have to get the support of the Senate, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. there's confirmation here. That's right. And yeah, and then they sit on the court and do stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a okay. lifetime appointment, I think. Right. And so these, and that's really, really a crucial point that Andrew just made, it's a lifetime appointment, right? So for a president to have the opportunity to appoint a Supreme Court judge is actually a really big deal, right? You, what you really need is either a judge to like, die or to <laughs> resign, which almost never happens, right? So it's, a, it's an incredibly big deal once there's a vacancy in the Supreme Court. Now, why is that a big deal for a president to have that power? Well, because, I mean, there are certain ways that you know the certain judges will vote. And um, if it's a basically a Republican majority in the... Uh, Supreme Court, then there are certain laws that will simply be struck down, and there are certain things that that court will rule on certain issues that has a real impact for what legislature can be passed and so forth. Yep. Whereas if uh, um, whoever drops dead tomorrow and Obama appoints a new person, that can really significantly shift the balance of what this country does in terms of its legislature and in terms of its laws. That's, that's really great. That's absolutely right. right? So let's look at something like abortion. So abortion since Roe versus Wade has been accepted uh, as a legitimate right under uh, American constitutional law. That's through, like a strained interpretation of American constitutional law. But anyway, so that's the kind of issue which could substantially alter if you had a different composition of judges, right? Because there are a number of judges who are currently on the American Supreme Court who oppose Roe versus Wade, right? Some of the most controversial judges uh, and conservative judges in America, such as Justice Scalia actively oppose the ruling in Roe versus Wade. So you'll see how if you happen to get enough judges who support that view, you can have litigation in America, which means that, that kind of case could be overturned, which has massive social implications. Right? And you see that with the range of other issues. So let's look at healthcare. How does the composition of the judiciary play into the 
uh, Obamacare legislation? Because if enough of them rule it's unconstitutional to take away the state's rights to govern on their own health care, whatever, then they can just strike it down. Mm -hmm. Whereas if a lot of uh, majority on the bench are in favour of it, then they won't do that. And they'll make precedents of not striking it down, which will make it hard for future courts to yeah. do that. And does anyone know where the healthcare legislation actually sits in reference to court challenges and that kind of thing? Okay, so basically the healthcare legislation has been challenged in a range of different courts, right, at lower levels. Okay? And different judges have said different things. In fact, all of the Republican appointed judges who have considered the case have said that it's unconstitutional, or the Democrat appointed judges have said that it is constitutional. Okay? And I'll look at that a little bit later. But basically, that's the kind of issue which will almost certainly go to the Supreme Court. So probably before the election next year, there will be a Supreme Court ruling on whether the health care law is constitutional. And that has massive implications, right, in American politics. So at the moment, the court is kind of, I guess, most accurately seen as having four conservatives, four liberals, and one swing vote, Justice Kennedy, who does random things all the time, no one really knows where he stands on anything, right? So it's very, very uh, difficult process to establish whether it will actually, the healthcare uh, law will be declared constitutional, right? So what Obama needs is for someone like Justice Scalia or Justice Roberts, one of the conservatives, to die so that he can appoint someone, right? But unfortunately, they seem to be in quite good at health. So that's the kind of thing which shows how inextricably linked, I think, politics and the judiciary are in the United States, okay? So, but one other thing, I point I really want to make, which I think is quite important. I think far too often in these kind of debates about um, American politics and what Supreme Court justice will do, there's a simplistic idea that judges are, you know, conservatives or liberals. They kind of have one view on every issue or another view on every issue. I think it's important to remember that sometimes you can't always predict what judges do. So in the past, we've had people like uh, Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, who is actually formerly a Republican state senator, if you could believe that, who came into power and became, uh, as a justice, and actually supported abortion rights and affirmative action more than a range of other judges, right? So you also had someone like David Souter, who was a Republican uh, aide to a congressman, who ended up being quite liberal in a lot of his positions on the court, right? So I think it's important to remember, and I, got, I was lucky enough to see a Supreme Court case when I was in Washington, that these judges are super, super smart. And you've got to be careful in debates, I think in all debates by the judiciary, saying that they will automatically do one thing or another based on who they were appointed by. Okay, the one other thing I want to add to the judiciary is the nature of the role. So we've talked a lot about this issue of the judiciary um, acting to limit the power of the federal government, right? So the federal government is seeing as going, going too far, the judiciary can step in. Let's talk about their role in interpreting the Bill of Rights. So can, can someone tell me about the US Bill of Rights? Well, it's the first series of amendments to the Constitution. Um, they basically enumerate a certain limits on federal power. So you can't make a law abridging the freedom of speech or the practice of religion. And, you know, those sort of famous ones. Okay. And do we have a Bill of Rights in Australia? No. We don't have a Bill of Rights, okay? So there's actually very little in our Constitution that actually exists explicitly to protect rights, right? There's a general, I think, freedom for religious expression to some extent in the Constitution, right? But there isn't a general freedom such as, say, of the right to bear arms in the Australian Constitution, okay? So that role of the Supreme Court is absolutely crucial in interpreting this Bill of Rights, okay? So you see, with something like the right to bear arms, because of that right, what that meant is that Washington couldn't pass a bill to restrict uh, access to handguns, right, to particular individuals. They couldn't even pass a bill saying that you can't have like a loaded weapon within 100 metres of a school, right, because that's seen as infringing the Bill of Rights. So those are the kind of situations where interpretations of those rights can be huge. In the same way, the death penalty, right, so the Supreme Court has held the death penalty doesn't constitute cruel and unusual punishment, which would violate the Bill of Rights, right? But you can see how a different court would say liberal judges might say it is cruel and unusual punishment, right? So that interpretive function, I think, is really quite interesting. Okay, so let's go through the second last thing, the election process. Okay, so we've talked 
very briefly about primaries, which is basically voters having the capacity to directly select candidates for election. So Democratic voters can select who will be the Democratic nominee for president, and Republican voters have the same capacity to do that. Okay, so what's the state of primaries in the US at the moment, just to give this some contextual weight? Does anyone know? Are primaries happening on a federal level? No. Okay, and when will they? What's the next big set of primaries we're talking about? Next year, isn't it? I don't know when next year, but yeah. yeah. Okay, and what's it for? Who's entering into the primaries? President. Yes, in which party? Republicans. Republicans, right? Okay, so, I mean, obviously it's possible <laughs> that President Obama will be challenged by some Democratic candidate, but it's, it's quite unlikely, right? Yeah. Realistically, what's happening right now is a range of different candidates are positioning themselves to be the Republican nominee for president. Yeah? So they only have the um, primaries when it's like for the, for the party wants to happen, like, is in you wouldn't do it if you have a sitting prime minister. Right, I mean, well, we saw it happen last time was because it obviously it was the end of the term, so it had to be a new president. So. Yeah, I mean, it's fairly rare yeah. that a sitting president will get challenged. Um, I think, we'll like, like, Jimmy Carter got challenged um, after his first term. Uh, so it happens, yeah. but generally the, the theory is it's a pretty bad idea within the party to challenge your own president sure. because that just weakens them, makes them spend resources they don't need to, ultimately undermining their chance of winning the more important battle. Yeah. Plus, you're unlikely to win because the president has so much name exposure. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so there are different types of primaries. Okay, so what's an open primary? What am I referring to there? Where anyone can vote in and for the leader, for, uh, for the candidate. Sorry. Right, exactly. Right. So say um, that someone is vying to be the Republican nominee. Right. S say in a particular state like Iowa is having its primaries. Right. Everyone in Iowa in that situation would be able to vote for who they think is the best Republican nominee, okay? Regardless of their political affiliation or whatever. What's a closed primary? Party members. Okay. And what's the advantage, arguably, of a closed primary? You don't have all the Republicans voting for the weakest possible Democratic candidate. <coughs> okay. So there's a theory that open primaries are vulnerable to being manipulated, right? Because all the people from the other uh, other parties will just gang up to pick someone really crap, right? I'm not sure how true that is in reality, but like, it's definitely an argument, yeah. Is it also because like, you have to challenge the other person so you necessarily show the weaknesses in the other candidate? Is that what happens with open? Because then you're like showing the weakness of both candidates, they fight each other, and then those can be called back up when you're actually voting for that person in the election. That's true of all primaries. Yeah, yeah. I, I think... Oh, sorry, was this specifically about... Right, so, yeah. so the open versus closed just relates to who the people are who are voting in oh, that particular sure. primary. I think your point is really good, though, about the general benefit of primaries, okay? Yeah. So what, what is the benefit of having primaries in the first place? More exposure of candidates, people see them, people know them more specifically, they know more about the policies and all that kind of stuff. So when it comes to the actual vote, they've got much more exposure. Right. And arguably you have better candidates, right? So say you have to go through like months and months of campaigning to actually win, <laughs> say, the Democratic nomination, like Obama did. Arguably that means that you've been forced to develop a really clear message You've had to build up resources, you've got name recognition, and you're a much, much better performer, which puts you in a better position to actually challenge uh, the Republican candidate. Okay, so what's the status of primaries in Australia? Do we use those, or how do we go about uh, electing individuals? Pre-selection, like parties. Okay, how does pre-selection work? Um, the, well, I, like, the ALP branch, more like the ALP gets together, um, like lists, like they do the internal voting first, and then they have like. Yep. Yeah. Well, I don't. Know. I've never been. Okay. So, so, so my understanding of the ALP process, not being a party hack, is that uh, branch members uh, vote for who they think is their preferred cap candidate, and that gets a particular weighting. But at the same time, the views of like the central ALP executive also gets a particular weighting. Right? And ultimately, I think that can actually override um, the branch member's view of who should be the best candidate for a particular seat. Okay? So that obviously constrains the extent to which every individual candidate is democratically elected. Okay? Now, in Australia, in, for example, with, this, with I believe, the state election, there's been trials now of having limited primaries in the ALP. Okay? Why do you think the primaries could be a good thing 
in terms of the types of candidates who actually get selected. Why did they end up being better candidates? Because they've already been media vetted before they go into the actual election, because they've already been forced to make their own their policy positions clear. Okay. And because what, what about the, the kind of people who get elected? Do we think there's any difference in terms of who would get elected if, say, it's branch members plus party executive making the choice versus anyone in the city? And the person will be more representative of the public interest or what the public actually wants out of the leader as opposed to what like, the party wants out of the leader because often the party's interest is out of the leader who will like do what the party wants, so be quiet. I'm trying to be apolitical about this, like who will stick to the party line essentially, right? They want someone who has been committed to that party for a very long time and potentially value different things about a candidate than the general public would, which might not be like, I don't know, 50 years of LP membership, but like being a good orator or like generally being sensible. Um, so they want different things. Absolutely right. And why could primaries lead to worse candidates? Because they have to be more extreme to get the people to vote for them and then so the people who uh, don't really have a membership of one party or the other go, I don't get a choice. So they then get to choose between two candidates, one who's supported by far left crazies, the other one who's supported by far right crazies. Right, okay. So the question you have to establish if you're having a debate about primaries, which are incredibly common, right, mm -hmm. is working out who's going to be voting in these primaries, right, what their incentives are versus what the incentives are of, say, you know, key party administrators and picking candidates. Right? So we've seen in the United States, right, a number of quite moderate <laughs> candidates becoming more extreme, and I think you could argue that's largely driven by the primary process. Right? So Senator John McCain, for example, faced a challenge in Arizona from Tea Party members who wanted to remove him. Right? And what that meant is that he ended up taking a really hard line on immigration that he'd never taken before, right? arguably to make sure that he could get through the Republican primary. Right? In the same way, you see something like a senator like Dick Luger, who's currently being challenged for his nomination. And he's a classic moderate who emphasizes bipartisanship. But for him, he's in a very difficult position. Because if he tries to be the kind of candidate that is moderate and reflects the views of all the voters in his state, he may not win the Republican primary. Okay? And I guess that's an argument in favor of open primaries. Right? Because at the very least, that means that you're appealing not just to the hard right crazies, right? but to a broader scope of the electorate both in terms of who's the candidate from a party and then in terms of who actually wins the election. Does that make sense? Okay. So, let's look now at campaign finance laws. Okay. So, I've referenced Citizens United here. Does anyone know anything about the Citizens United uh, case? So that was a ruling in the Supreme Court. Um, anyone have any idea? Okay. So, Citizens United is one of the most influential, I think, American Supreme Court rulings in terms of the way campaign finance works. Okay? So what that meant is it overturned previous uh, legislation which meant and meant that corporations and unions could spend whatever they like for or against candidates. Okay? So the restrictions on what corporations and unions could do in terms of producing particular uh, you know, election advertising, advertising campaigns or whatever were lifted. Okay? So what that meant is a much broader scope, arguably, for corporations and unions to influence uh, presidential elections. Okay? And what we see in America is, I think, a real problem in terms of the way the disclosure system works. Okay? So in Australia, for example, you're allowed to contribute particular amounts to candidates, right? but there's also fairly strict regulation in terms of the disclosure of who's actually disclosing that expenditure, uh, of who has to disclose that expenditure. What happens in America is that you get these kind of front groups, which are called political action committees, and corporations can funnel money to them <coughs> to run campaigns on their behalf without having to disclose who they are. Okay? So an example of this is what's called the US Chamber of Commerce, which is like a really like benign label. But the US Chamber of Com Commerce gets bucket loads of money from corporate interests right, to defend particular positions. But the problem is, you don't know who those corporations are, right? Why could that be a bad thing for democracy? Because money has influence. It influences those people with the power to make money, uh, to make decisions in the way you want. If you can't see where it's coming from, it's much harder to challenge them or to say that the reason you're doing this is not in the greater interest, it's because that's where the money's coming from. 
Right. So it's an issue of accountability, right? So how can the public hold a particular politician for, to account for taking X amount from you know, a mining company and then supporting their positions if they don't know that it's a mining company who's actually donating to them? Okay? So that's the example of some of the problems which can occur in the situation. Okay? But why could you argue it's actually a good thing to not have really, really strict disclosure? Why, why is it defended in the US? Is anyone there? Freedom of speech. Okay, and how is that argument made? Why is it freedom of speech? Well, if you're limiting somebody's ability to say something about these candidates, you're limiting the public's ability to hear about these candidates and to hear about these issues, which is arguably in the public interest for them to have that information. Yep. An argument made by my dad last night, which I thought was interesting um, in this debate, was that um, it means you actually get better discussion. The discussion is focused around the policy, whether or not the policy is a good idea or a bad idea, as opposed to who supports that policy and who doesn't support that policy. Because like, in a system where you know exactly who's funding any particular campaign, you're just going to say, oh, the reason you're supporting that policy is because you get money from X person, as opposed to actually interrogating the policy itself, whether or not it's a good idea. That was Absolutely, idea. right? So the risk is that once you have really strict disclosure, you end up just shooting the messenger. Right? rather than really evaluating the policy. Because ultimately, voters are going to make their decision realistically on the policy itself. Okay, so, so there's one issue there in terms of disclosure. There's another issue just in terms of the impact of money in changing decisions, right? which is the point that Beck was referencing. Right? What's one way in which you could reduce the impact of money in the American political system? A cap. Yeah. Okay, you could set a really strict cap on how much any candidate can spend in a particular election. Why is that potentially a good thing? It deepens the playing field a little bit for potentially four candidates that have no money versus ones with a large amount of money. I mean, the ones with no money still have no money, but if they have a relatively small <coughs> amount of money and the other person doesn't have millions of dollars, yep. that at least deepens the playing field to some extent. Which means that they have to fight based on issues rather than name recognition. Okay, sure. uh, it means parties and candidates spend less time trying to fundraise and more try, time trying to actually create policy and right. talk about that policy and support that policy? Because I'll be arguably the impact of money is really corrosive to democracy, right? We've seen Obama's campaign team talking about a target of $1 billion spent on the upcoming presidential election, which is unprecedented amount of money right, in a particular election campaign, right? And arguably, that means that particular candidates can saturate the airwaves, use attack ads, use direct mail, use everything, to the point where the actual democratic debate gets crowded out by the volume of the message, right? I think one thing, though, to keep in mind, actually, I want to make two points which I think are quite important to this particular debate. So far too often, I think, in campaign finance debates, people say, you know, whoever gets more money is always going to win, right? And that's just not the case. So recently uh, in America, last year, you had uh, billionaires like uh, Meg Whitman and Carly Fiorina, right, who are like really, really powerful uh, corporate executives with huge amounts of spending, actually lose those elections, right? And that's because ultimately their message <coughs> was not getting through. So you have to question the logic that you can just buy an election by having the most money in the field, right? Obama wouldn't, uh, you know, Obama's money probably helped him reach out to different markets but it didn't necessarily mean that he won the election per se. The other thing I think is worth, worth mentioning is I think it's important to be really nuanced about the extent to which money sways politicians. So I think too often people in debates kind of assert that, you know, it's almost like a bribe, right? Like if a mining company comes up to you and says you can get X amount of money if you support X position, that'll just happen. And that's just not necessarily the case because ultimately politicians have to evaluate whether that position will be supported by its membership, whether that position will be supported politically, whether it's actually a good position, right? Obviously, you can argue that money makes a difference in at least clouding those incentives or confusing that choice, right? But I think you've got to be careful just arguing that money means you get whatever position you want, right? Like Tony Abbott, sure, may have been influenced by donations by mining companies, but he's probably also influenced by the fact that the Liberals just don't like big <coughs> taxes on sectors like mine, right? So you have to be really clear about how that impact actually works. And I can tell you from my experience um, in a senator's office is that you had a flood of lobbyists coming in like every day, constantly, right? And a heck of a lot of the time, they'd, they'd have their meeting, they'd speak for an hour, and then they'd get absolutely nothing they wanted. 
right? Even though they're obviously impliedly promising, you know, future campaign contributions and that kind of thing, right? If the benefit doesn't exist to politicians, they won't necessarily always give it. Um, Beth? I was just going to ask, is there ever a room in that sort of debate to bring up kind of the waste? Is there a, a way of bringing up the kind of like problems associated with waste of money in that sort of way? Or is it... Is that ever valid or not? Valid? What do you mean by the way? Like, just like, you know, you're spending all the billions of dollars of money that could, you know, isn't really going towards achieving anything or, or other than, like, if you put a cap on it, you could have the same outcome or is it? I, I think, look, I mean, I don't think waste in itself is that much yeah. of a harm, right? If some stupid candidate decides that they want to spend X amount, that isn't necessarily the really relevant harm. The relevant harm is, I guess, whether it actually leads to worse quality democracy and worse quality debate. I think that's the kind of thing you want to focus on, right? But I think <laughs> to argue it's a waste is actually quite useful to the team that's arguing um, against a cap, right? Because you're saying, if this money isn't working, right, then it probably isn't going to be used. Like, that's not that significant a harm. <coughs> okay, so last slide. Interesting issues. Um, this is just stuff I wanted to talk about for a few minutes, I think it's fun. So, election 2012, who's going to win? Obama. Yeah. Obama, I agree. Who are the Republican candidates? Can someone tell me some of the like, high-profile Republicans that have decided they're not going to run against Obama? Trump. Trump, yeah. Trump. okay. That's probably a bad thing for Obama. If Trump was magically the Republican nominee, I think he would win by about a thousand percent. Okay. Who else? Mike Huckabee. Who's Mike Huckabee? He was always ranking like third on the overall Republican primary votes. And I don't know much about it. Okay. He always seemed like a nice guy. So, so Mike Huckabee was the former governor of Arkansas, I believe. Um, and he had a monopoly on the kind of social conservative wing of the Republicans. Right? So he's decided to bow the race largely because he's kind of broke and really needs his endorsement from Fox News. I'm actually not kidding about that. Okay? And then you have a more recent one, which is actually really significant, I think, which is uh, Mitch Daniels, right? who is a governor uh, of a swing state, who's actually got a really strong record uh, on fiscal policy. So what that means is I think that the Republicans have actually quite a weak field. Okay? But there are a number of people who are worth knowing about. And the reason these people, I think, are worth knowing about in debating is often there's this trend for topics to be set, which are like, we would rather vote for this person than this person. We'd rather vote for McCain than Obama was a pretty common topic. Uh, back around the presidential election. I think something at MUDS recently was there was three topics where we would vote for Mitt Romney, that we would vote for Obama, or that we would vote for the leader. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, I assume so, I accept that. Yeah, yeah. Right, there you go. Right, okay. So, very, very quick overview of some of the candidates. Um, so, okay, so there's Mitt Romney, who's the front runner. Who's Mitt Romney? Mitt Romney? R O M N E Y. Who's he? Uh, a Mormon? Yes. That's a, that's a selling point. He's like, I'm the Mormon. Vote for me. Does anyone know anything about the guy that um, did Obamacare but not Obamacare in his own state yes. and now is facing problems as to whether or not? Yeah, absolutely right. So when Mitt, Mitt Romney is the former governor of Massachusetts, right? And when he was governor, he set up a healthcare plan which is almost exactly the same as Obamacare. In fact, they called it Romney Care. Right? And now he's in a difficult position because he's trying to win the Republican nomination by explaining how bad Obamacare is and how he'd repeal it. Right? But he's still the prohibitive front runner, which I think it shows what the field is like. Okay. And then you have Tim Pawlenty, which I think is someone who's actually quite important and should be known for you guys. Who's Tim Pawlenty? Okay. Tim Pawlenty is another former governor. Um, he's a, he was formerly the governor of Minnesota, um, and he's the kind of guy that's generally seen as the kind of classic second pick, like the nice guy that no one really takes seriously, but could end up doing some cool things. Okay, I think he's someone to keep in mind because his organisation has been really, really quite strong, and he's recently announced he's running. Problem is that Paul Lenti, along with Romney and another candidate, uh, John Huntsman, all supported cap and trade a few years ago, and now have to appeal to the wing of the party that doesn't even believe that climate change existed. So they're in a bit of a pickle. Okay. Then he has a, a lot of like hilariously joke candidates like Herman Cain, who was the former CEO of Godfather's Pizza, yet he's still seen as the guy with the massive mustache. He's a black guy, yeah. yeah. Um, he's seen as the most exciting candidate in the, in the field with his <laughs> pizza experience. Um, you have Newt Gingrich, who divorced his wife at the hospital while she was suffering uh, from cancer. Went to the hospital, gave the papers, and looked at it. 
quality guy. Uh, and then you have Ron Paul. Okay. Now, Ron Paul is someone who's quite interesting. Can someone tell me about Ron Paul? He has a really good um, small government fiscal policy background, doesn't he? And he was governor of somewhere. I can't remember. Um, he, has, he has an interesting mix of policies, so from what I understand, but it's become kind of the Right. So Ron Paul is part of the libertarian wing of the Republican Party. Okay. What does what do libertarians stand for? I think that's something that's quite important to know because that political philosophy is actually really, really prominent in America. Uh, the government barely existing, like just not doing anything. Right. So what Ron Paul and his acolytes support is basically shutting down nearly every department, not quite every department, right? But they want to shut down huge swathes of government, right? What else do they support? So libertarian emphasis on on freedom, I guess. What are the other views? Issues. Right, right. So he'd support like legalizing heroin, for example. And he said that, which is quite awkward in a recent Republican fact. Okay. So it's it's very, I guess, almost left wing to an extent, maybe, on those kind of issues. And then they're right on financial stuff too. Yeah, exactly. So debt and deficits is their massive issue, right? So they think it's it's outrageous that the government is spending as much as it is, the government should back out, drastically cut what it's spending. Okay? And also that the US should just pull out of all its wars and all its foreign commitments, right? And just leave those other countries alone, okay? So it's a very distinct philosophy. And Ron Paul actually did really quite well last time he ran for president, right? He was never a serious candidate to win, but I think he ended up probably placing about third in the pecking order of Republican candidates. Yeah? Is it normal for people to have to run a couple of times to build up momentum from primary to primary, or...? I mean, it often happens, but I think someone like Ron Paul runs almost every cycle, and doesn't necessarily get much further, right? But arguably his issues... It's not that good solid voting block. Right, his issues get more prominent, right? In yeah. the same way, there's a Democrat named Dennis Kucinich, who runs pretty much every year on the basis of ending X war. So I'll end this war, I'll end this war, I'll end this war. Like, whatever new war comes up, you'll end it. Yeah. <laughs> so those are the kind of people yeah. that you get yeah. Okay, so moving on to things that are also interesting quickly. The big issues in American politics right now. Okay, so I'm going to go through these quite quickly, starting with the economy. Okay, so the key thing to note about America, I think, is that the economy is recovering to some extent, right? Like, I think over 200,000 uh, jobs were created in the last period that it was measured, right? The key issue, though, is that that rate of job increases doesn't necessarily mean that the unemployment rate is actually substantially reducing, okay? And the reason for that, I think, in a number of ways, is because of things such as the way the economy itself is changing. Okay? So the first issue is this issue of productivity. Okay? So American businesses have become a heck of a lot more productive, arguably. They need a lot less people to produce the same output. But obviously that's not a good thing in terms of creating jobs. Right? And then the other factor is globalization. Right? The fact that you can outsource work to people who can do it much cheaper and often of a better quality Right? means that even though these companies end up actually doing better, that doesn't translate into more jobs. Okay? So what that kind of uh, suggests is happening in America at the moment, a number of economists are suggesting this, is that you're getting growth without actually getting jobs, right? which is actually really harmful and may undermine Obama's chances in the next election. Okay? Because no president has been re-elected when the unemployment rate has been higher than 8%, and it's now, I think, just over 9%. Okay? So there's an issue of employment, which is going to be really, really constant, and I think could be a relevant debate issue. Then there's debt and deficits, which I think surprisingly doesn't get much attention here. For all of the American press, this is the issue that's the front page pretty much every day. Okay? So, can someone tell me, why are deficits such a major issue for the US? Because Congress has to approve the amount they borrow. Okay, so I mean, there's an issue of congressional approval, and we'll look at that, okay, in terms of the process. But just looking at where the U.S. is now in terms of how much, how much its deficits are, what's the issue? It's really badly in debt, um, and it keeps running deficits and expects to keep running them basically indefinitely at the moment. Okay. Um, I was going to say that, and also, isn't there something to do with, um, like, it's, it's all foreign debt, they owe China, and basically if another co like countries were to pull in their debt and stuff, they have no way of paying it back, and we're just going to pay it back. Yeah. So there's, like, actual, like, yeah, issues with Right, okay, so the US, what they're doing is to sustain their current spending, they have to borrow a heck of a lot of money. 
right? Which is fine in the short term, right? Like it seems like a pretty safe bet to lend to the United States. The risk is down the line, investors will do what's happened in places like Greece, where they actually lose confidence, right, in America and their capacity to repay this kind of debt. What happens at that point, right, is that it may mean that there's a massive spike in borrowing costs. Right? It may, might become much, much harder for the US to actually get the money they need to sustain itself. Right? So you could have what's known as like a sovereign debt collapse. Okay? Does that make sense to people? So the idea is it's fine in itself to borrow money. The risk is when the market loses confidence in you. And that could happen right, if the US isn't seen as taking enough steps to put itself in a path where it can get out of how significant these deficits are. Is that also um, specifically problematic for the US, not just because they have so much money, but also because they don't have um, cash reserves, like, like the US doesn't keep foreign country, currency reserves or anything like that, so whereas other countries when they when their debt start coming in and they can call in, can dip into that, what would the US do? What, like realistically, what would happen to the US if that kind of happened? Okay, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert on US's foreign, foreign currency reserves, but what I'd say is they're definitely like almost entirely dependent on borrowing to sustain their debt, right? So there are obviously things like taxes, which are other ways of collecting money, but at the moment, those taxes aren't set at a high enough level to actually help even rebuild this deficit, right? So the problems are really, really systematic. Right? So there's a range of, and the question is then, what is actually driving this deficit? Like, why is it spiraling out of control? Can military spending. Sorry? Military to an extent, okay, so military spending, I think, is, is stabilized at around about $700 billion a year. Social security. Social security? Yes. Yeah, even healthcare costs as well. Absolutely, right? So the big crucial issue in relation to the US budget, which I think is going to be the center of a lot of debating topics, because it just has to be, it's the most important country in the world, is entitlement reform, right? So that's reform to Medicare and Medicaid, which is things like providing healthcare to individuals. It's like social security. Right? So these are the kind of um, uh, entrenched elements of the welfare state right? which are becoming unsustainable. Right? And why are these costs ballooning out? What are some of the reasons why? Asian population in the US more dependent on those services. Absolutely. Right? So as the population ages, more and more people are going to have to rely on these services, which is already a massive budget limitation. Yeah? In particular in the US, the obesity epidemic is like, like significantly increasing health care costs. Right, absolutely. So lifestyle diseases certainly play a part as well in enhancing that, okay? And so there's all of those problems in terms of entitlements being too costly. And then there's other problems such as things like trade deficits, right? Because the US imports so much more than it actually exports, right? So what that means is that there's a massive battle in America right now, right, about how to respond best to this problem of entitlements. So what is the Republican response? Does anyone know? Um... Their treasurer as such, well, their shadow treasurer said something about virtualization, which I don't really understand, but like, instead of giving people money, giving people vouchers, which then magically turns into hard operations. Right, okay. okay. I think that's absolutely right. So basically, there's been a plan released by a guy called Paul Ryan. Okay, so Paul Ryan is a member of the American House of Representatives, and he's seen as like the big Republican ideas guy. Right? And what he's basically done is released, I think, quite a bold plan of how to reform this issue of entitlements, okay? how to control this issue of spending. Okay. But, so what Ryan's plan involves is a number of things. But the, the point that um, was just made by Ron is this issue of a voucher system for health insurance. Now, does anyone know how a voucher system works? You guys, it's much fun, should know. We do that. Um, basically, a voucher system means that you get a voucher that is theoretically worth some money, but it usually requires you putting in some money of your own. So you might get a voucher for health insurance. It just means that the state is agreeing to pay a certain amount of money. You then go along to your health insurance industry and hand over that along with your cash or your employer's cash, mm -hmm. which means if you want a really good health care plan, you end up paying a lot more. But maybe that voucher will cover an absolute dead basic like you get to go to a GP once every six months, but usually it'll only have a really small amount of that plan. Okay, so there's, there's two different kind of philosophical approaches at play here, right? So the Republicans, right, obviously prioritize things like choice. So their idea is, we'll give you X amount of money, 
you go out into the market and pick whatever plan you want. Right? You don't have to get health insurance if you don't want it. Right? But if you choose to get health insurance, you go and pick what's best for you. Okay? The Democrat approach right, is to mandate health insurance. So they're saying every single person should get health insurance. Right? For those of you who can't afford it, we'll help you pay for it. Right? And once they do that, the Democrats, like the people, uh, like a medical board, will decide what kind of treatments you can claim. Right? And then you can go to the doctor and claim that treatment under Medicare. Okay, so those are different philosophical views. Okay, what's the potential problem with this idea of choice as a philosophy, or the Republican plan? It assumes you understand what you're choosing, and it also assumes that you have the money to pay. In. So they've just lost a, a special election in one of their House of Rep seats in the New York State over the last couple of days, and one of the reasons they lost it was that it's all of these seniors coming out and saying, "My my former employer doesn't provide any kind of health insurance for me as a retiree." So under your plan, if I want health insurance, I'm paying five hundred dollars a year out of my own pocket, where just to get this voucher to use it for anything. Yep. Um, so what it means is that those who can't pay in actually don't have any choice anyway. They just get a voucher that's useless. Yep. Actually, just on that, the question I'm trying to working out is obviously with the large aging population you know, making up a significant portion of the voting base. What is the is it likely that there is actually going to be any bipartisan move towards reducing health entitlement and entitlements? The Republicans lost an election overnight on that basis. So there, like it's um, the most conservative seat in New York, and, and they lost it to the Democrat. And my thinking was that usually um, aren't Republicans the ones that like pander to the well, both both the, the both parties do, but I, my my assumption before that policy came out was that the Republicans would be the ones to win back the elderly vote on the healthcare system, but now I'm trying to look at what's sure. going to happen. So basically, this is where the battle lines are drawn, right? What the Democrats are saying is that the Republicans are trying to end Medicare, right? That's their line of attack. And that's what helped them win uh, the special seat that Madeline just referenced, right? So they're basically trying to do, I think it's probably fair to say, some extent to a fear campaign, right, about what the Republicans want to do. The Republican line is that they're trying to actually save Medicare. And the justification for that is that if we don't act now to balance these costs, we won't be able to afford Medicare 10 years down the track, right? But this issue is really, really difficult because it's such an easy political opportunity for both parties to exploit, right? So at the moment, there's a real stalemate, I think, in relation to this issue of the deficit. So the Republicans are saying, we are not willing to support tax increases at all, even on people who are in the top 2%, right? People who earn over $250,000 a year. We're just not going to support taxes. And we want to reform Medicare. The Democrats, on the other hand, are saying we're only willing to support very limited spending cuts and we're not willing to make really massive changes to this issue of entitlements. So arguably, both sides are being quite unreasonable in terms of what their lines are. Okay? But at some point, I think uh, President Obama has to drive a compromise in his own electoral interest. Right? Because this issue is very concerning to people. So, very last couple of quick things on this economy issue, which I think should be mentioned. Firstly, there's an issue about raising the US debt ceiling, which I suspect if you haven't heard about, you will hear about a lot in the next few months. So basically what that means is that the United States is only allowed, according to Congress, to, to borrow and to spend a certain amount of money, right? So Congress has to be willing to approve the US's debt going beyond a particular point, right? What the Republicans are saying now is that we're not willing to approve a debt uh, extension, right, unless you're willing to make equivalent spending cuts. Okay? And the, the Democrats are saying, no, that's ridiculous. Right? We just need to make sure that we increase the debt ceiling, because if we don't do that, the market will lose all confidence in our ability to repay our debt. Okay? So the debt ceiling is one important issue. The last economic issue I want to quickly mention is the issue of a balanced budget amendment, okay? which does come up quite often as a debating topic. So can someone tell me, what is a balanced budget amendment? How would that work? Is it <clears throat> when they force them to not cut deficits? Or is that something different? Right. So it's basically a legal requirement right, that particular spending can't exceed a certain threshold. Right. What would be the justification behind that? They need to start reducing the passive debt. Yeah, but why do we need um, you know, a kind of a legislative restriction. Surely they'll just do it anyway, right? 
because government's always had an incentive to promise bigger spending in elections to try and win. Yeah. And so you like cap the amount to which they can try and outdo one another on a spending basis, and means they now have to start outdoing one another on a like efficiency of spending basis, as opposed to just an overall amount of spending. Right. So it's about the incentives of government, right? Maybe government doesn't have a sufficient incentive to actually do the right thing on its own. Right? What's the argument against having this kind of uh, restriction? Um, well, the amount of money that governments like take in on a year to year basis isn't actually really controlled by governments. Like how in, in Australia this year we have a heaps bigger deficit because our tax revenues are down and governments can't really control that on a year to year basis. Mm -hmm. So if you have balanced budget amendment right, if it works how I think it does, then basically in some years you'll just have to make weird random cuts to meet the balanced budget amendment because of other bad things that are happening elsewhere, and that could compound those problems. Right, so, uh, sorry. Uh, go. Uh, like, reduces their ability to, like, act in a crisis, I guess. Right, I mean, we've even seen with the tornadoes um, over the last day or two, the massive amount of federal spending that's required, right? And that's the kind of thing you can't necessarily predict as a government just through some, something as blunt as, I guess, a balanced budget amendment. Also, it doesn't deal with the government incentive stuff. It just means they have to, because obviously they still have to make a, a judgment about which things lose out, and often it's the most vulnerable people who lose out. So, for example, they'll just cut all unemployment benefits and stuff like that in order to make the balance budget. Absolutely. What's What's interesting, I guess, just one last kind of distinction here, is that the Republicans want mandatory uh, caps on spending. Right? Because obviously their big issue is that government is spending too much. So once we reach a certain point, there should be an automatic restriction on what government can spend. The Democrats, uh, some Democrats, such as Harry Reid, have supported a mandatory cap on deficits. Right? And what that means is once you get to a certain deficit, you get a combination of spending and tax increases. Right? So the Democrats are more comfortable with the situation which means that if the deficit gets too big, right, tax increases may need to be part of the picture. But the Republicans obviously hate that idea of tax increases. Okay, so <coughs> I'm going to do literally a 40-second overview of the last few things, so I can avoid taking too much of the other people's time. Illegal immigration. I guess this is obviously a politically hot issue, both in terms of conservatives who believe that the American economy is too open to illegal immigrants, but also in terms of the significant Latino bloc, right, who are actually incredibly influential in determining. Um, U.S. presidential elections because of their demographic sway. Okay, so the key thing to remember, and this debate is almost like a perpetual um, electoral debate uh, in America, is that there are, I believe, if my figures are right, somewhere between 12 and 20 million illegal immigrant workers in America. And the issue is what do we do with them, right? Because arguably they're beneficial to the economy because they do a lot of jobs we need, right? But arguably they're harmful because they take our services and, and commit crimes, that kind of thing. I'll talk about this under... Oh, you are. Awesome. Okay. So, um, listen to Gemma about that. Obamacare, I've already spoken about. Um, the only thing I want to mention is the key like, political issue to consider with Obamacare is this issue of what's called the individual mandate, right? Requiring each individual to buy health insurance, whether that's a legitimate restriction of free speech or not. Uh, of, sorry, a free choice or not, right? So why would it actually be a good thing? Why is it necessary to require individuals to purchase health insurance? Other than it's just good for people to have health insurance, why else would it be worthwhile? People are bad at um, making decisions about like long-term spending, mm -hmm. so they'd rather have the money now and spend it, meaning that if they do get sick, they have nothing in stable from them. So like, people are generally bad at buying insurance because they don't see the value in it, which is why you have to mandate that they do it. Okay. Why is it actually good for the system, though, um, if everyone's forced to buy insurance? Maybe also because the um, that American policy that they've got where hospitals have to treat someone, you have to treat someone if they're admitted, but all of the time that person may not have the funds to pay for that treatment, so in that kind of... Yep. And screen. when you get to that stage that you're in an emergency room having to be treated, it's usually because you've had a small thing, or possibly usually, because you've had a small thing that's gotten progressively worse. If you would have treated it while it was small, it would not have cost anywhere near the same amount of cash to treat or the same amount of resources to treat. Sure. So let's say we have a hypothetical Matthew Wilbraham, right? <laughs> Matthew does not have health insurance, okay? So if he goes to the hospital and uses the emergency room, he's effectively free riding, right? He's basically uh, taking advantage of the money that's been putting into the system by everyone else to take advantage of that health care. Whereas if he was mandated to get health insurance, 
right? Those costs diminish because the emergency room doesn't have to treat them and spend those resources. Okay. Energy policy, the only thing to mention is this issue of offshore oil drilling, which is flaring up again in the US, right? Gas prices are incredibly high, and there's a lot of political pressure on Obama to increase the amount of offshore oil drilling in the US, right? And he actually has approved a number of permits for that kind of drilling. But as we all saw with the BP oil spill, that kind of 